Hello, and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson, the political and legal correspondent. And today, one of our guests, our guest is a candidate for statewide office. It's the uh, public uh, Department of Public Instruction or the State Superintendent of Schools. And uh, my guest name is Jill Underly. Jill, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Jamie. I'm happy to be here. Now, I will always give candidates first chance to introduce themselves. You and I had a chance to chat for two minutes prior to going on camera and found out that we, that where you currently work is where uh, I grew up that area and I had relatives in the Pecatonica school area. So why don't you tell the folks what it is that you're doing now as superintendent of Pecatonica schools, and then just a little bit about your background, and then we'll get into running for office after that. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for this opportunity. First of all, I'm really excited to be here and to talk about the office and talk about public education. So um, yes, my name is Jill Underly. I'm the superintendent of the Pecatonica Area School District in Southwest Wisconsin. So we're in the Driftless area, like much of Southwestern and Western Wisconsin. Um, I live on a small farm with my husband and my two middle school aged children. Um, we have a a Labrador retriever moose and a flock of chickens and we grow cider apples. So that's our, um, that's our thing here. Um, I've been the superintendent of Pecatonica for seven years. And prior to that, I've been an elementary principal, middle school and high school principal. I was at the DPI under Tony, uh, Governor Evers's first term in office there at the DPI. I worked at UW-Madison in student affairs, uh, generally advising um, first generation college students, many of which were from rural and urban um, Wisconsin. Um, I've worked in Title I schools. I've worked in urban and suburban and rural schools. So I've got this um, very um, wide breadth, I, I, I guess, of experience in public schools. Um, I'm running for a lot of reasons. Well, well I, I, I was just going to ask you oh. about that, why you're running, but yeah. um, just to I, I'm curious because this is the first time I've met you face to face and mm -hmm. I've heard about you and so forth. But uh, did you start at the age of 12? I mean, with all that you were talking about? Um, I, I hit the ground running. Let's say that um, uh, when I was in an undergrad in college, I started substitute teaching. I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. I had some really fabulous teachers. And so I started right away in um, my teaching career. All right. So it sounds like you're pretty happy in administration. You have a good a background in both rural and urban, and you're in an ideal area of the state. At least that's the way I remember it from 40 years ago when I left that area. But um, so why is it that you want to stop being the superintendent at Pecatonica and now be the state superintendent um, of our whole Department of Public Instruction? No, it's a great question. Um, I am very happy being an administrator in Pecatonica. I live here. I love the kids. I love the people here. Um, as I shared, I did work at DPI. And so when I left DPI and I came to Pecatonica, it's like the picture just became very crystal clear for me. Um, we have so many inequities in our public school system. Um, and I know that being at DPI, I could help, you know, disrupt those systems of inequity. Um, you know, there's so many things that plague our public school system. Um, we see them prior to the pandemic, and now we see them um, exacerbated by the pandemic. And so um, when I was crafting my platform, I drew on all these different experiences. And that's where I came up with the, you know, the platform that I have that is rooted in equity. Um, I want to, um, you know, every child every day deserves early childhood programming doesn't matter who they, you know, who their parents are, where they live, what zip code, how much money their family has, they should have access to the highest quality early childhood programming because these are proven, you know, to set kids up for success for the rest of their life. Every child deserves access to passionate teachers, you know, well-educated, enthusiastic professionals who will shape their lives, you know, for the remainder of their lives. And um, we need that in Wisconsin. There's a severe teacher shortage, and that's certainly, it's inequitable. It impacts the highest need students in the highest need schools the most. Um, every child deserves access to mental health. We knew prior to the pandemic that there was a mental health crisis in Wisconsin. There is a shortage of providers, um, and the schools are on the front lines. 
you know, of the mental health crisis. And so during the pandemic, we've noticed that it certainly has gotten worse. Um, and so my platform um, will get more resources to our schools to get to the kids that need it the most. Um, and then finally, it's school funding. For me, I'm 100% pro public schools. I believe our tax dollars belong in our public schools. Um, and for so long, we've seen, um, you know, this transfer of our public dollars to the private sector, you know, voucher schools, for example. And what we're finding is that it's depleting our public schools. Our, we have a number of referendum coming up on the ballot April 6th, um, and it's disproportionate you know, to the schools that have to go to referendum. They're the rural schools, they're the urban schools, um, they're the schools that are already on shoestring budgets. And so every time a referendum is passed, our school funding formula becomes more inequitable. And so that's why I'm running. I wanna disrupt these systems of inequity that really are hurting our public schools. Okay. So we got the why you're running and you kind of also dipped into it, but just clarify for us, your areas of focus, then what would you give priority to? Yes. So school funding is certainly probably the, the, um, the, the base, I suppose, for my, my platform, because everything else can't really happen unless we have adequate funding in our schools. So at equitable school funding is the number one priority. Um, kind of tied into that, though, is early childhood programming. We need to reimburse our 4K programs you know, at 100% right now, they're 60%. We need consistency and kids deserve it. Um, the other piece is the mental health. You know, there's a shortage of providers. Um, we certainly need to get more people into the mental health profession. Um, we've been successful in my school district working with providers remotely and doing telemedicine or having them come to our school. Um, but we need more counselors. We need social workers. We need school psychologists and there's a shortage. So. You know, working with groups, the professional organizations um, in particular, and then also the, um, the preparation programs for, in our colleges and universities to get more people into this profession would be great. And then also, um, you know, that ties into teacher recruitment and retention. We need to get more people into teaching and we need to diversify our teaching force too. We need to have teachers who look like the kids um, that they're teaching. And we also need, um, you know, white students to, you know, learn from and have mentors who don't look like them too. So we need to really look at our systems. Um, but again, it's going to take money. It always does. So what are you proposing? Um, are you in favor of revamping uh, the school funding formula? Yes, um, that's a great question. Yes. So um, in 2017, I'm sorry, 2018, the Blue Ribbon Commission on School Funding um, came forward with their recommendations, um, and I'm in full support of those. Um, there's a couple of things here that we need to talk about, though. Um, the, you know, for example, I spoke about school privatization. The voucher program in particular um, takes $350 million each year out of our public schools. And that goes into voucher programs in private schools. Um, we need to look at that. I mean, that's a huge problem. When you look at, you know, schools having to go to referendum, I mean, I think that starts with why they need the money because they've been, um, they've been starved for the money. Um, there's also, you know, I'm going to fight for every kid. And that's, you know, that's the job of the state superintendent of public instruction. And I think we need to hold, um, you know, the voucher system accountable. I want every kid, in access, every kid in Wisconsin to have access to a great education in a great school with great teachers. Um, they need access to technology. We need to fund libraries. Um, you know, we need, we need special education reimbursement. And so the Blue Ribbon Commission actually um, gave us a roadmap on how to get to that point. Um, this was a bipartisan committee. Um, so reimbursing special education, reimbursing English um, learners um, and their services, you know, high poverty aid. These are things that benefit all kids. And so, um, you know, the current formula is broken. Rich kids get great schools and everybody else gets left behind. So we need to make it more equitable so that those wealthier districts still have great schools. But every other rural, urban and suburban district where the kids' parents have less money also have great schools. And we can fix the problem. Um, I'm encouraged, you know, Governor Evers' budget is a step forward. Um, the Blue Ribbon Commission, as I mentioned before, gave us that 
you know, that path, you know, for that step forward. And I'll be fighting to solve the problem every day as state superintendent. Okay. So as state superintendent, does this necessarily mean, uh, you know, more taxes? Because that's what some people hear when they say more funding. But I'm also hearing you say, for example, you were first to mention the voucher system and mm -hmm. the fact that right now those tax dollars are being siphoned off to the private sector. You would uh, seek to get that changed and try to get that those funds redirected back to public schools without increasing taxes? Yes, we need to rein that program in. The voucher program, like I said, $350 million a year that comes out of education funding and goes to the private sector. So we pay taxes as property owners. Um, on our tax bill, we just see the amount that goes to our local school district. We don't see the amount that actually goes to the private schools. Um, so we need to make them accountable. They should have that accountability on our tax bills because I think most people in Wisconsin really don't know how much money goes to the voucher program. The other piece of that is that people are raising their own taxes every time they vote for a school referendum. And when you look at it that way, they shouldn't have to. We should adequately fund our schools. Why is it that we have to put that responsibility on the people who are already you know, paying their taxes? Well, it's funny you mentioned that, and I wanted this is my segue to ask um, about because we're mentioning about school funding and um, the property tax burden and referendums. There mm -hmm. was a resolution um, proposed by the school board that I serve on. By the way, I'm the president of our local school board here in Hudson, and um, our resolution passed uh, at WASB um, by quite a good majority, and that is trying to emulate Iowa to a certain degree, of course, we wanna make it work for Wisconsin, but Iowa has this penny for schools tax, which takes a 10th of a percent for, uh, from the sales tax and dedicates it to capital projects so that school districts aren't having to choose between um, academics books and, and bricks and mortar. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would uh, allow it would be disseminated on a fair basis per capita so that smaller districts still get a proportionate share, but then um, it's money that can be banked and used when appropriate by school boards um, so that administrations don't have to mm -hmm. uh, you know, go to referendum in order to improve their outdated facilities. Is that something that you could get behind? Yes, 100%. We need more revenue streams into our public schools for projects, like you mentioned, with facilities. When I talk about equity, I mean, or when we talk about inequity, or we talk about opportunity gaps, I mean, it's not just in our human resources and teachers, it's in our facilities. You know, you look at some of these um, buildings, and they have wonderful HVAC systems, and they've got beautiful auditoriums and 21st century classrooms. I mean, tell me who's going to learn better in, in that situation, somebody who's going to school there or somebody who's in a building without, you know, air conditioning and taking a test, you know, so, um, or working in a building like that too, on the third floor in 90 degree weather. So it's, it's really a question of equity when you think about our facilities too. And in particular, when you talk about COVID and they say how it spreads, you know, they say it spreads through the air and that you have to mitigate that through, you know, updated, having updated, yeah. Ventilation updated systems, HVAC. absolutely. Now you mentioned accountability. Um, would you su be supportive then of requiring the same oversight of schools that accept vouchers as public schools? Yes, 100%. Okay. So, and you mentioned COVID. Um, by the way, I have to ask, I failed to do that when we were off camera, but is Pecatonica face-to-face -face learning? And if so, how long have they been doing it? Yeah, we've been open face-to-face um, -face, um, for the vast majority of the school year. We gave parents the option um, early on. We, we made a collaborative plan over the summer. We worked all summer on it, and it was, you know, a collaborative plan. It included school board members and parents, teachers, union members, administrators, um, community members. And we came up with the idea that we would give parents a choice. They could have their kids go face to face as long as we could, you know, if there were no hot spots, for example, with COVID, um, or they could choose 100% virtual. And so initially it was about 80% of our kids were face to face. 
Um, it's been, tr- you know, it's been tough on our teachers to do both, but our teachers have been incredible. Um, they've accommodated. Um, after the semester, we were about 90% face-to-face. We had a, you know, a group of kids come back. Um, in the fall, like everybody else, um, we had a period of, you know, two weeks here um, that we had to close. Um, and then we ended up um, going virtual 100% right around the Christmas holiday break. So, but other than that, we've been, we've been open. Okay. That sounds very similar to our school district and other school districts in our area here. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, we get a lot of jealous uh, parents and uh, folks from Minnesota that uh, they've been shut down and haven't been able to meet in person. So, well, with that uh, COVID and that there are some districts that have opted um, to not learn in person. And uh, you mentioned how those imbalances and the lack of technology can only be exacerbated for our you know, poor uh, students and so forth. Mm-hmm. So what's your stance on statewide testing this year? Um, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it's really, it's one of those questions that, um, you know, I, I sometimes wonder if there's really any good answer, but I, I will tell you my perspective on it. I mean, first of all, what is testing going to tell us, right? It's that the best resource schools, the kids who have internet at home, um, you know, they're going to have the best test scores. Um, They're the kids that weathered the pandemic the best. They'll be, you know, they'll, they'll have the good test scores. And then the ones who struggled, right? So the students with disabilities or the EL learners, um, the kids without internet access at home, you know, they're, they're not going to have good test scores. Um, my school district has been testing fine. We've been doing formative assessments throughout the year, and our kids are, are doing, you know, as well as they would in any other year. But it's a shame that the way I look at it with the assessment, and I look at this also from the perspective of a teacher, too, is that the kids who already have so much anxiety, you know, and are in under-resourced schools, um, you know, like I said, they're going to they're going to be afraid that they're not going to do well on the tests. And I so I don't think we should have had testing this spring. Um, I think the directive uh, should have been made by the federal government. However, as you as you know, the federal government left it to the states to decide if they want to apply for a waiver. You know, um, what's that going to do? You're going to have inconsistency throughout the entire country. So really at the end of the day, kind of go back to my first question, what's testing going to tell us? And so I think that the directive should have been made um, by the federal government and not left up to the states because again, we want consistency. Okay. Now, what do you think uh, uh, that DPI's role ought to be in closing the achievement gap in this state? Yes, so that's really something that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, I was the first person to talk about the achievement gap, though, um, by talking about it as like opportunity gaps. Because when we talk about an achievement gap, I think we're putting the onus or the blame or responsibility on the backs of the kids. There's systems in place that have been in place for nearly a century, right, that um, give some kids opportunities and leave other kids without. So you look at after school programming, you look at, you know, quality child care, birth to three programs, early childhood programming, you look at facilities, right? You look at who has the best teachers, who has the best paid teachers, who's got the new teachers, um, who's got, you know, the outdated curriculum and textbooks. And really it comes down to opportunities. We want to make sure that every kid has the best opportunities. And so the role of DPI is to really direct and disrupt those systems that deny kids opportunities. Whether it's through funding, you know, and directing the funds to the schools that need it the most and the kids that need it the most, whether it's working on licensing and making sure that we have, um, you know, passionate educators in every classroom and that we're not operating on emergency licenses because we couldn't find somebody certified. I mean, those are the things I talk about when we wanna look at achievement. We need to make sure that we have consistent opportunities and that every kid in Wisconsin has that equal shot. You've mentioned this um, teacher shortage impacting, you know, the issues of equity. So how would you propose that you get more teachers, particularly teachers of color, uh, into the profession? And, you know, what would be DPI's role there? 
Yeah, so DPI, one of their roles is licensing. And they work with the colleges and universities and schools of education to make sure that we have a well-qualified um, teaching force. And then they, they, you know, issue the licenses. They work on professional development and, um, you know, educator development. So there's a few things that I would look at, you know, as state superintendent. First of all, I'd work with our teachers. I would work with our unions. I would work with our teachers of the year. Um, I'd work with our colleges and universities to make sure that we are doing everything we can to strengthen the pipeline. Um, when people go into teaching, especially first-generation college students, they shouldn't be graduating with loads of debt that exceed the amount that they would be earning, you know, as a teacher. So I think that there's some issues there. We could look at cohorting. Um, you know, there's some organizations right now, um, one that was developed by the National Teachers of the Year called Educators Rising. And it's meant to, if, you know, when you were in high school and when I was in high school, they called it Future Teachers of America. And it's similar. You know, it's meant to recruit people from high school who show promise to become a teacher, um, you know, set them up in a cohort. In, in urban schools in particular, this is a good model that they use in other kinds of careers. You know, there's um, programs on every campus, you know, for STEM, for example, or for engineering um, is to get a cohort of, you know, your classmates to go to the same university. So you have a group that you can navigate the system with. Um, and that's really important for, you know, first generation and also um, kids of color who are going to, to college. Um, but we also need to restore respectability to the pro profession. I've studied the issue a lot. And really, we need to look at why people aren't going into teaching. And it has a lot to do with low pay, sure. But there's also been an attack on teachers um, in the past, you know, 10, 15 years. I mean, there's been a cut to their benefits, a cut to their pay. And um, frankly, if you graduate with a degree in chemistry, you could go into teaching, you know, and earn $36,000 your first year or go into the private sector and probably earn two or three times that amount. So you, it shouldn't have to be a choice. It should be, it is a calling for sure, but we need to, we need to do what it takes to re keep the very good teachers um, into our, in our schools. Well, mentioning the teachers and you've talked about working with the unions before, mm -hmm. um, I noticed that I believe you had the endorsement of the teachers when there was seven people running in the primary. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it that you think you got the endorsement over any of your opponents? Yeah, so WEAC did recommend me as their candidate um, for the primary. Um, I'm a listener. You know, I, I, I firmly believe in bringing all voices to the table. Um, I have a strong labor background. I was, in a te I was a teacher um, and I was in my union. I was also my union vice president. Um, my family has a very strong labor background. I also, I think I, you know, I understand what it, what it means to have um, a career with family sustaining wages. And I want to strengthen the teaching profession. Um, like I said, I, I'm a listener. I wanna bring people together to solve these problems. And I think that they recognize that. Um, and when we talk about opportunities, and we talk about gaps. I mean, teaching, like I said, is a calling. And I think that, you know, I'm passionate about education, just like every teacher that I've ever met. Um, and I think they recognize that. So uh, what have you done yourself professionally that has made the largest impact on kids? And how do you measure its effectiveness? Yeah, there's, you know, this was kind of a tough one for me, because there's been several things that I feel like that have been great, you know, for kids. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you about one that's recent and part of my platform. Um, we are in a rural school district, like, you know, many of the around, around where you are, and we have a declining enrollment problem. Um, so we were looking at it and we realized that we also have a number of families that open enrolled out of our school district because we didn't have access to childcare. Um, you know, birth to three programming is tough, but then once you know, they find a good child care for their kids. Sometimes it was out of the community and sometimes it was in a community maybe where the parents worked. So we looked at ways to retain families in our community so they wouldn't open and roll out. 
So we started wraparound programming, you know, before school and after school programming. Um, I wanted to model it after some of the best programs that I'm, you know, aware of, you know, in suburban um, Dane County, for example. Um, and so we did that. We brought in, um, you know, we, we do programming like after school art and we do, you know, athletics, recreation, those kinds of things too. So it's a lot of enrichment, but kids um, get to, you know, get their homework done, they get a snack, they get to run around. And so when their parents pick them up, all they have to do is feed them dinner, you know, story time, bath time, go to bed. So it takes a lot of stress off of parents. Um, then we expanded that. We went from half day 4K um, to full day 4K. And when we, you know, we, we thought about, well, what kind of cost will that be? Because the state only reimburses us for about 60%. Um, my school board didn't care. They were like, nope, this is a proven program, full day 4K, offering it every day, um, sets all kids up for success. So they looked at it from that equity lens that we wanna make sure that all kids in my school district get that strong start. And parents can choose not to you know, send their kids, of course, it's not required. But what we found was it was wildly pop popular, especially in an area where we already had um, shortages for elementary age childcare. Um, and so how did we measure this? One, we measured it based on, were we seeing the same number or more families open and roll out? Our open enrollment dropped. And we knew that once we got those kids early, they were gonna stay with us, you know, for the remainder of their, mm -hmm. you know, their elementary and middle and high school career. So that was one way we measured it. We wanted to retain families, check. The other piece was unexpected, although not entirely so, because like I said, we wanted to give every kid that same strong start. We noticed consistency in growth in our, in our academic scores, right? Um, kids were getting served. They were getting breakfast, they were getting lunch. They were getting consistency in their academics, you know, they all got that same strong start. Um, they were forming relationships. It's hard to form relationships when you're only there 60% of the time. Um, but now that they're there every day, um, we had hoped that would happen. And we were very happy, of course, that it did. So that's one of the reasons I wanted, you know, make sure that that opportunity is available to all kids because we know that strong starts set people up for the rest of their life. You know, good health, good sure. job prospects, lower crime, sign me up. So, so um, this final question is probably easier to answer now that we're after the primary than it was when you had six opponents, but yeah. what makes you a better candidate to handle the challenges in this state than your opponent? Yeah. I guess what uh, sets you apart? Yes. Yeah, I've thought about this quite a bit. Um, well, first and foremost, I'm the only candidate um, running currently running a school district through the pandemic. And a lot has changed. You know, I mean, we're coming up on a year, right? In two or three weeks, March 15th, that'll be one year. And so I've been with the pandemic and running a school district since, from the very beginning through all the summer aspects of planning to the reopening in the fall, to the closing, the virtual, to reopening, all of that, right? So that's been, um, you know, I think one thing that sets me apart. I also have over 20 years of experience in all levels of public education. As I shared before, you know, K-12, higher education, I worked at DPI. Um, I'm also a parent of kids who are currently in public schools. Um, and one of my children is on the autism spectrum. So I, I come at it from a parent perspective of not just a, of a child with um, disabilities, but also a parent whose kids are also weathering a pandemic. And this experience has given me, <clears throat> excuse me, this global perspective on our public education system, not just as an employee or a leader, but also as a parent. Um, I'm sorry. I also have a very strong record of fiscal management in my district, and I'm unapologetic, 100% pro public schools. So, you had mentioned before that I was backed by, um, you know, or supported by WEAC. I have the backing of so many progressive legislators and progressive organizations, um, nonpartisan um, elected officials throughout the state of Wisconsin. Um, 
recently, actually today, the Wisconsin Rural Schools Alliance came out and endorsed me and my campaign. Okay. Um, and I'm very proud of that because two thirds of Wisconsin schools are rural. Um, while my opponent was backed by Scott Walker on election day, he tweeted that he had voted for her. Um, I have the skills, the experience, um, and the perspective needed to take DPI um, and the helm, I'm sorry, of DPI and lead our public schools, not just through the crisis, but also to provide every child every day with a public education that they deserve. Very good. Well, with that, I, we've come to the conclusion of our time. Is there anything else that you would like to tell folks? And do you have a website or a Facebook page that you would like to promote? I do. I have both. So thank you for asking. <clears throat> I would just love for people to vote. Okay, so we've got April 6th coming up. It's coming up fast. It's just five and a half weeks away. Um, if um, I've got events, I've got ways people can volunteer or get involved. Um, my website is um, www.underly, F-O-R-W-I.com. So underly for wi.com. And I'm also on Facebook. Um, as Dr. Jill Underly for Wisconsin. Okay, and is that doctor, is it DR or is it spelled out doctor? It's DR. DR period, Dr. Underly for Wisconsin? Yep, Dr. Jill Underly for Wisconsin. And that's the Facebook page. And otherwise the website is Underly for WI. Correct. Very good. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks for asking about that. You bet. Just wanted to clarify that and... Uh, you want to encourage folks to vote. So do I. So thank you for being a guest on our show. Good luck in the race. And uh, we will say to our viewers, thank you for watching. Please go to the polls informed and uh, make sure that you do vote. Uh, even if there isn't a Supreme Court race this year, like there's been for the right. last couple of years. So uh, thank you for your time. And it's nice to meet you, Joe. Of course. Thank you too. It was wonderful to meet you too. All right. Take care. Take care. And Thank you viewers for watching and we will see you soon with another interview from Western Wisconsin Journal.